today, my friends, is Covey, which is under the crazy ass free channel. I'd like to speak to you about Bitcoins. What is a Bitcoin? Bitcoins are not a fiat currency and have been described as digital gold. They are a scarce as virtual commodity whose supply will never exceed 21 million coins. The rate of release into the marketplace is predetermined, with all of the Bitcoins being mined by the year 2140. The miners are rewarded Bitcoins by working on complex puzzles, which is essentially a giant ledger of all Bitcoin transactions to ensure that no coins are double spent. Miners randomly receive Bitcoins proportional to the amount of computing power they devote to the network. No matter how many people mine, the rate of Bitcoin creation remains predetermined as the difficulty of finding Bitcoins adjusts to the total network computing power. Like gold, Bitcoins are scarce, divisible, fungible, portable, and durable. They have all the characteristics of money and may very well be the most important invention since the internet. In a world where a group of people can devalue a currency, I welcome the arrival of Bitcoin. I suspect many others will follow, and I believe it is worth the risk of owning. I and many people are thankful to this peer-to-peer -peer exchange by beginning to decentralize our commerce tool. This is the very same tool Jesus went into the temple and showed real emotion and threw the money changers from the temple. Some even state it could be the next cyber Christ to save us from the last 2,000 years of greed, in which someone wants to control something that should be decentralized and owned by everybody. It is the very reason, the very cause of all that has been made impure by certain people's need for greed. This will finally allow all of us to see that there is enough in this world for everyone, all seven billion, but not enough for a bunch of asshats greed. According to Reuters, undisclosed documents indicate that financial firms such as Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs have visited the Bitcoin exchanges as often as 30 times a day. Additionally, employees of other international banks and major financial organizations have also shown an interest in this Bitcoin. After this news report from one of the founders of the Bitcoin, I will give you more detail and understanding what the hell is a Bitcoin. You know, I like this floor. This is the glass things. It's very like airy and bright. This is Ami Ataki, one of the developers of Bitcoin, the fastest growing currency in the world. He lives in a deserted office building in central London. Bitcoin is, is like a virtual currency just like you have like dollars, pounds, euros, but it's the first time that we have a, a virtual currency or a type of currency which isn't controlled by a central institution. It's completely decentralized. I can send money to whoever I want, whenever I want, wherever I want in the world, and nobody can stop me. Bitcoin is what money should be. Mihai Alissi is editor of Bitcoin magazine. Bitcoin is to banks what email was to postal offices. Instead of going to a bank, respecting their schedule, paying their fees, I can transfer money to Ethiopia, Egypt or China from my living room without anyone knowing who's behind the address B and address A. So when you make a Bitcoin transaction, it goes into the network and it needs to become confirmed to actually make it into this uh, distributed database that everybody keeps, this ledger. And to do that, some people have to solve some mathematical puzzles. And people who do that get a small reward. And that's how new Bitcoins are introduced. In circulation, there's around 10 million at the moment, but eventually that will go towards 21 million by around mid-2030 and then uh, the supply will stop. It's limited supply. Uh, this is a physical Bitcoin. The value of the Bitcoin is given by the code that it's behind this hologram. So when you peel this off, you, you will have a code that you can redeem for one Bitcoin. There are exchanges like Mountain Gox and others where you can redeem the code and you can receive one Bitcoin to your wallet. Well, at this point, this works about 
45 pounds. It's the best performing currency worldwide. Lots of things start to happen around Bitcoin. We started to see Reddit recently started accepting Bitcoin, the thing with Mega, WikiLeaks was accepting Bitcoin. We have here a price chart that shows um, the price for the past year. During April, June, you were able to buy a Bitcoin for about four or five dollars. And now you can buy one Bitcoin for about sixty seven dollars. I actually had like loads of Bitcoins when it's 0 0.06 and then the price started to go up. So I was like, shit. So I sold them all and then like I made a hundred dollars and I was like, woo. But then it actually like went up to one dollar. And then I was like, crap, okay, so I wait for it to go down again, but then it went to $2, but then it went to $30. I was like, fuck, if I kept it, I would have had half a million dollars. But I didn't, so whatever, like. I'm not in for this because of like personal profit or something. Like I think, like I, I, I love like money and like the issues behind it and how it works in the society. But for me personally, like, I, have, I don't have need for like a car and I just need my internet, my laptop. Bitcoin has been criticised for facilitating the sale of drugs on sites like Silk Road. Bitcoin is a tool, right? So for example, you have a knife. And with that knife, you can put butter on your bread or you can kill someone. But you make the, the, the tool bad or good. The real like, way to combat drugs is not by punishing people for consuming drugs. It's like, it's like Try, it's like when they tried to stop people having sex, you know, punishing people for having sex. It doesn't, it doesn't work like that. People are going to do that. What you can do is educate people. Tell them, oh, these are bad drugs you should stay away from. These are the health effects of these drugs. You know, if you need help with drug addiction, this is where you can go. At this point, we don't have uh, political penalties for politicians going, oh, yeah, let's ban Bitcoin. You can buy drugs online. You have Silk Road. We cannot control that. So let's ban it. But um, if politicians would ban Bitcoin for being able to do that, for, for being able to go on Silk Road and buy drugs or whatever, it's like um, burning an entire village in order to roast the pig. So that doesn't make much sense. Amir took us to the room he's currently sleeping in. He lives with just a few bags of possessions. And like, I feel responsibility, like, I have this skill that not many people have. So I, and like, I would feel bad if I was like working in some corporation just writing code that goes into some black hole. Putting more things in your life doesn't make you happier. You need to have passions and interests. Bitcoin is definitely more than a get-rich scheme. And I think it's the next uh, big technology that will revolutionize our society after the internet. It's as big as the internet or maybe bigger. It was only in February that the Bitcoin's value exceeded $33 US. And here we are mere two months later and it's been seen over $80 US. What the heck are all of you waiting for? And I've shamefully only got in at $70. And do we wish to free ourselves? Then you need, all of us need to support this change. The Cyprus Bank Control has given us, every one of us, a real taste of reality. The banks control your money and the governments can do what they will as they will with it. Jeff Berwick, a founder of StockHosts.com and CEO of TDV Media, announced Monday his plans to open the world's first Bitcoin ATM in Cyprus citing the ongoing bank bailout, bank closures and capital controls now being pushed in that country. It'll be interesting to see the results. In November 1st, 2008, a man named Satoshi Nakamoto posted a research paper to an obscure cryptography listserv describing his design for a new digital currency that he called Bitcoin. None of the list's veterans had heard of him. And what little information could be gleaned was murky and contradictory. In the online profile, he said he lived in Japan. His email address was of the free German service. Google searches for his name turned out no relevant information. It was clearly a pseudonym. But while Nakamoto himself may have been a puzzle, his creation cracked the problem that had stumped cryptographers for decades. The idea of digital money convenient and untraceable 
liberated from the oversight of governments and banks had been a hot topic since the birth of the internet. Cyberpunks, the 1990s movement of libertarian cryptographers, dedicated themselves to the project. Yet every effort to create virtual cash had been foundered. eCash, an anonymous system launched in the early 1990s by cryptographer David Chum, failed in part because it depended on the existing infrastructures of government and credit card companies. Other proposals followed. BitGold, RPOW, Money, but none of them got off the ground. One of the core challenges of designing a digital currency involves something called double spending problem. If a digital dollar is just information, freed the corporeal strictures of paper and metal was to prevent people from copying and pasting it as easily as a chip of text and spending it as many times as they want. The conventional answer involved using central clearinghouse to keep a real-time ledger of all transactions ensuring that if someone spends his last digital dollar, he can't then spend it again. The ledger prevents fraud, but it also requires a trusted third party to administer it. Bitcoin did away with the third party by publicly distributing the ledger, what Nakamoto called the blockchain. Users willing to devote CPU power to running a special piece of software would be called miners and would form a network to maintain the blockchain collectively. In the process, they would also generate new currency. Transactions would be broadcast to the network, and computers running the software would compete to solve the irreversible cryptographic puzzles that contain data from several transactions. The first miner to solve each puzzle would be awarded 50 new bitcoins, and the associated block of transactions would be added to the chain. The difficulty of each puzzle would increase as the number of miners increased which would keep the production to one block of transactions roughly every, every 10 minutes. In addition, the size of each block bounty would have every 210,000 blocks, first from 50 bitcoins to 25, then 25 to 12 and a half, and so on. Around the year 2140, the currency would reach its preordained limit of 21 million bitcoins. When Nakamoto's paper came out in 2008, Trust in the ability of the governments and the banks to manage the economy and the money supplies was all but lost. The U.S. government was throwing dollars at Wall Street and the Detroit car companies. The Federal Reserve was introducing quantitative easing, essentially printing money in order to stimulate the economy. The price of the gold was rising. Bitcoin required no faith in the politicians or financiers who had wrecked the economy just in Nakamoto's elegant algorithms. Not only did Bitcoin's public ledger seem to protect against fraud, but the predetermined release of the digital currency kept the Bitcoin money supply growing at a predictable rate. Immune to printing press happy central bankers and Weimar Republic style hyperinflation, Nakamoto himself buying the first 50 Bitcoins which came to be called the Genesis block on January 3rd, 2009. For a year or so, his creation remained the province of a tiny group of early adopters. But slowly, word of the Bitcoin spread beyond the insular world of cryptography. It has won accolades from the digital currency's greatest minds. We die, inventor B Money calls it very significant. Nick Zabo, who created BitGold, hails Bitcoin as a great contribution to the world. And Hale Finney, the eminent cryptographer, behind RPOW says it's potentially world-changing. The Electronic Frontier Foundation, an advocate for digital privacy, eventually started accepting donations in the alternative currency. This is all of our government's logic at its worst. If it moves, regulate it. If it keeps moving, tax it. And if it stops moving, subsidize the hell out of it. Thank you all. God bless each and every one of you and all those your heart touches.